Most couples' sex life consists of what Dr. David Schnarch refers to as leftovers. So your partner has things that they don't want to talk about, they don't want to do, it makes them really uncomfortable to even consider doing specific sex acts, let alone even talking about them. And then you've got the things that cause you anxiety and nervousness, the things that are kind of off the table or fantasies that you don't want to bring up and talk about. And what's left over after all of the things that you're uncomfortable with is what your sex life consists of. Now, if you want to have a vibrant, lasting, passionate sex life, it's going to require you to have some difficult conversations, conversations that might cause you and your partner anxiety. But most people don't know how to initiate those conversations. They don't know what they should talk about. And therefore, their sex life suffers over the duration of their relationship. So in today's episode, I sat down with an amazing therapist. His name is Doug Braun Harvey. He's a good friend of mine. And we talk about the six principles of sexual health, or in other words, the six principles that you need to have conversations about if you want to have a healthy, vibrant sex life. Now, when I learned these six principles, I realized that the vast majority of them I had not talked to my partner about. And I'm guessing that the things that we're going to talk about in this conversation might be new ground for you as well. And my hope is that this conversation, this interview that I did with him will kind of give you a gateway or a passageway to start having some really meaningful conversations around sex and decrease your anxiety levels and increase your ability to connect with one another and explore what else is on the table for you and how you can negotiate those things and develop a really amazing sex life. I hope you enjoy the episode. It's a powerful one and one that I will go back to and re-listen to over and over again. I hope you enjoy it. I am really excited about the next few minutes that I get to spend with Doug. So for those of you who don't know Doug, Doug Braun Harvey is a psychotherapist who specializes in helping people treat out-of-control sexual behavior. He has this amazing book that I have almost finished reading. It's a dense book. Uh, it's called Treating Out-of-Control Sexual Behavior, Rethinking Sex Addiction. And uh, he wrote it along with Michael Vitorigo, uh, Vigorito. Yes. Is that how you say his name? Yeah, Vigorito. I, Correct, I haven't yeah. met Michael, but I'm mm-hmm. grateful for his work and for your work. Mm-hmm. And together we've been um, doing the Rethinking Porn Addiction show. And I have learned more from you in the last couple of months, just kind of getting to know you and and, and about your career and what you specialize in um, than just about anybody else. And it just it's it's changed my life. And I wanted to share you with my people, with my audience, for people who don't know who you are. So thanks for being willing to come and spend some time with me. I I really hope that um, those of you who are watching live, pull out your notebooks because Doug uh, is profoundly wise and says things that will change your life if you pay attention. So thanks for being here, Doug. <laughs> well, that's that's quite an introduction, Nate. I, I, it's, I, I I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm not blowing smoke up your skirt either. <laughs> like I I mean I mean what I say. Thank you. I appreciate that. So the way I've kind of positioned this conversation is um, is that couples can have a more uh, true and exciting and intimate sexual life if they're willing to have sexual health conversations. And there's nobody I know who is more gifted at having sexual health conversations than you. And so I want to kind of rewind a little bit and and start at the very beginning and talk about um, maybe the six principles of sexual health, how, why they're something that you are so passionate about and, and kind of maybe funnel into how we can use those principles to start having sexual health conversations with, with ourselves and with our loved ones. I, you know, I appreciate that as a starting place, Nate. I, you said a phrase that I don't know even if your listeners are familiar with, and it's the phrase sexual health. Um, you know, people may think they have a sense of what those two words together mean, but I like to I like to just let people know what I mean and what a lot of people in the world mean who've thought a lot about sexual health um, before we get into the principles of sexual of health. But sexual health... Sexual health um, prior to the 1970s pretty much meant only two things. You just didn't get a sexually transmitted infection and you just didn't have an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, That was it. Uh, You just avoided those two things. And that was sexual health. So it's like, don't get knocked up. Don't get the clap. You're good to go. Uh, And uh, so it's really the reason I say that sexual health as an idea is still a relatively newer idea far beyond just avoiding negative outcomes. Uh, And that's since the mid-70s. 
So, so that, that, you know, this isn't something that's like when people hear the word sexual health, like, why haven't, how'd I miss out on that? Uh, it, it's actually a fairly relatively new idea for the world and the planet to think about. But the, the most essential part of sexual health is that sexual health is a balance between two aspects of sexuality that are, that are inseparable. And that is, if you're going to have sexual relations, you have to have some idea of how to make it safe, how to how to have it not have harm, or how to how to have some parameters around it, so that there's 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 a way in which to play safely. Um, and then it's pleasure. Um, mm. We have sexual activity because it's pleasurable um, and meaningful. Um, and so, sexual health is, in its most basic, this balance between safety and pleasure. A balance between safety and pleasure. I don't think, until I met you, I had never heard anybody talk about sexual health in that way. And I think it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful visual for me to think about this this balance between the two. I think, um, I think the problems occur inside of a sexual relationship when there is too much weight given to one of those two things. It's an imbalance. You, yeah, yeah. Sexual health is a balance. So it doesn't matter which direction, uh, you know, the imbalance is, it, sexual health is going to be elusive without a respect that it requires a balanced relationship between both. One is not, um, you know, a, a, a more essential than the other, because the reason we want to be safe in our sexual lives is so we can have pleasure. And if we're going to have pleasure, it has to be within certain parameters of safety hmm. um, or there'll be harm. And it, it, so it, 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 you can't just kind of have one without the other. Can you can you give me some um, like practical examples of maybe people who've gone too far in one direction or the other and, and, and what that could look like? Well, I work with men with out of control sexual behavior. So let's let's talk about uh, the responses that can happen in a relationship when a man is not. And I'm going to say men because I worked with men with out of control sexual behavior for 25 years. Um, it, when a man doesn't keep a relationship agreement, let's say their agreement is um, they only have sex with each other. That's a very common, very, very typical sexual relationship agreement in many, many couples, um, most by far. Uh, and so the man doesn't keep that agreement, right? For whatever reason, he has sex somewhere else with somebody else, and it's not within the re- agreement of that relationship. Um, it might have been very pleasurable, Um but it, it, you know, there were some real safety concerns there. Uh, it was a, a protection against a pregnancy. Uh, was there protection against a sexually transmitted infection? Uh, you know, I always like to talk with men about the first five minutes they go home after home after having kept this whole relationship agreement, and the five minutes they spend in the house uh, with their partner for the first time, trying to make sure there's no evidence that they haven't kept the agreement. Um, and there's sort of an exploitive dimension to that. Uh, you know, I, I know I haven't kept the agreement. I'm going to try to make everything, you know, in the next five minutes, convince you that I did keep the agreement when I was away from you. Um, and so there's, you know, lack of honesty and, uh, and, and oftentimes there's, you know, not having common values. These are all, these are all in play you know, it, commonly, this, this is just a, a, you know, this happens. I love that. So, so that's like leaning too far on the, maybe the pleasure side of things without safety. What, it, what would it look like on the flip side? If somebody were to lean too heavily on the safety side? Well, it, I work with men without a control such a behavior and they can learn on the other side. So yeah. let's say it gets discovered that this man has not kept the relationship agreement. And then the partner becomes a monitor uh, of, and it becomes hyper focused on monitoring the safety of this marriage um, and and is is watching and observing and preoccupied with keeping track of everything being safe and no no arm, no injury is going to happen here. Um, and that kind of preoccupation with safety and monitoring and and uh, observing and keeping track of is not hot. It's not erotic. It's it doesn't create a sexual interest and pleasure in a couple. So the, the safety can become so preoccupying, uh, it 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 uh, it's it uh, suffocates the pleasure. Got it. I like the idea of suffocation because there's lack of oxygen. And if you we often talk about passion as like a spark that you need to nurture, 
that's a good analogy. And flames need oxygen. They need room to breathe. If you're going to, if you're going to fan those flames and turn it into a roaring passionate fire. So a, a very, a very uh, esteemed and, and valued uh, sex researcher and therapist who's now no longer with us. Jack Morin wrote a book called the erotic mind. And one of the things Jack talked about in the erotic mind is that for erotic energy to happen, there has to be a spark. And the only way you get a spark is there has to be space. Sparks don't happen without a space for an arc of energy to go. And so so couples need this as well. The, uh, the more fused and absolutely lack of any separation there is in the couple, the more difficult it is to sustain erotic pleasure and energy in the couple. Mm. That's a really great and beautiful analogy. Thanks for elaborating on that for me. So for couples who want to, um, I think there's probably, I know for a fact, there's going to be couples who watch this and maybe every couple who watches this or every person who watches this has never had a conversation with their partner or even with themselves about the balance of safety and pleasure. Yeah. Or or that, that both are important and how to create both within themselves and within their partnership. So I'd love to go over just with you what are uh, some good places to start having this com- this type of a conversation? Well, every marriage does start with a sexual health conversation, and it's usually done uh, in a religious ceremony hmm. uh, in front of one's family and community. And there's these sort of you euphem- great place to have a sexual health conversation. Well, well right? there actually is one that happens there because there's these euphemisms that are typically re- referred to in a marriage vows. They're not really clear and direct. It's not like the marriage vows is you know from this day forward I am only going to have sexual relations with you and no one else. They don't say that. They, they kind of use flowery language and, you know, you know, that sort of allude to the fact that they will right. only be sexual with each other. And one of the things I like to do in weddings is I lean over to the person I'm next to and say, you know, that's the last time they're going to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> until, until somebody gets hurt. <laughs> until somebody gets hurt. That's right. It's, it, it, you know, there's a lot of assumptions from that point forward. Once a, a relationship enters a marital agreement, um, uh, uh, and the dilemma is the, there's the couple relies a great deal on assumptions. And that what ends up happening is until somebody hurts somebody, these conversations don't happen. And, and oftentimes there's assumptions. Usually one of the big assumptions is nobody in the couple, and it depends on your listeners and where they're at with their values about solo sex and masturbation. But there's certainly no discussion about what is my sexual life away from my partner with my own body. That is like, just never talk about it. It's just, you know, to, until again, somebody injures somebody, they're observed looking at sexual imagery or they discover they were masturbating some way. Um, these are, so these, these conversations get avoided. Um, and so that's where these six principles of sexual health come in. They're, they're a way to sort of think about how to have these conversations. Um, the, the first sexual health principle is consent. It's the most universal sexual health principle on the planet. Now, we know many couples, um, one or both members of the couple, may have at some point in their life had their own experience with non-consensual sex. Um, and the most common place this happens is in their home with a, a, a family member, with a, a, a friend, uh, somebody who comes into the home, a, a, a babysitter, a caregiver. Um, it, it can happen where there's some sort of adult and authority around um, who's been given responsibility for taking care of a, a child, and they non-consensually violate uh, this child in some sort of sexual behavior. Um, this happens in high percentages in our country. And wh- why this is so important is consent is the most fundamental sexual health principle, and yet it's one that it, we don't know how, how to do very well in, in uh, not only in our country, but in the world. Um, so non-consensual sex is a violation of a sexual health principle. The sexual health principle is consent, meaning that all sex should be consensual. Um, and so, you know, we, we, a couple in and of itself may sit and think about, have we ever talked about the fact that one or both of us have a history of non-consensual sex? And it may not be with ourselves. Uh, perhaps a sibling was involved in non-consensual sex in a family member, or perhaps a, a relative uh, was involved in some sort of sexual offense or uh, some sort of, you know, non-consensual activity that was part of the history of the family. These things are never spoken of. Hardly ever. 
Right. Um, and yet, so non-consent it kind of lives within many couples and families, and it's just never spoken of. And there's there's a, a way that you kind of talk about consent that I think it, it's important to clarify in the context of um, a sexual health conversation, because I think a lot of people will think, um, well, consent is doing something without my permission. Like a- anything in our in our sexual relationship without my permission constitutes a vi- a violation of consent. Yeah, and and I think it's a little bit more specific than that. Yeah, and I think this is really important, Nate. I, I feel really strongly about this. Um, uh, not keeping an agreement in a relationship is not the same violation, the same egregious harm to a human being as violating their personal body uh, and violating their their right to say no uh, and having that respected from your your own bodily integrity or even visually, you know, exposure to nudity or sexual activity or other things that you did not give consent to. Um, Those are egregious violations. And oftentimes in couples, the idea of non-consent or or consent um, gets far too generalized to mean just doing something without permission or violating an agreement. Now, those are significant events, but we need to reserve consent to those specific experiences between human beings where we don't violate the personal body and space of another human being without them saying yes. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. So some great ways to talk about this would be to say, like, how do we treat consent in our family? Are we allowed to say no? Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have a history of non-consent in your family or in your own life? And if so, can we talk about that? And what can we do to to make you feel safe and secure or make our home a place that is safe and secure or our bedroom a place that is safe and secure? Um, One of my favorite moments, I've done this uh, as a family member over and over and over again with all the children in our family that I'm related to, where, you know, you you meet them and the, the child is expected to go up to this family member who they don't even hardly know yeah. kiss them or hug them and and you can see this like look on the child's face like i don't want any part of this and the parent going no no hug your uncle yeah. you know and i have spent a lifetime saying look they don't look it's fine they don't look like they're interested in this we don't need to do this right. but i'm trying to model that a child is trying to say i'm not saying yes to this and this is a vital interpersonal skill to teach a child they have the right to decide who touches their body. Beautifully said. Okay, what's the next principle that you want to talk about? Non-exploitation. Uh, it's the only sexual health principle that's worded in the negative. Uh, non-exploitation. Uh, we, I've, not, I've not found a nord. Have I looked in the English language to find an alternative word that's w- worded in the positive around uh, not engaging in exploitive behavior. But non-exploitation is really a big difference between consent uh, and non-exploitation. This is a big one that a lot of people get confused. Um, I, one of the ways this has really happened recently is within the Me Too movement. Uh, it, it, if you've listened to a lot of the people that are very prominent who've been a, a, a alleged to engaged in all sorts of really harmful and and and, and, and per, uh, you know um, you know predatory sexual behavior. They they they'll talk about this distinction between, um, uh, you know, it was always consensual, you know, it, you know these these two adults that are involved. In right. it, it's always consensual. Okay, it might in in, in other words, it might have been like the person. Both people said yes. They might have said yes, but it was very exploitive. Uh, and so the, the Me Too movement is bringing exploitation out into the dialogue. Is exploitive sexual behavior an acceptable form of sexual behavior? Is Are we saying the only thing that counts is consent? As long as it's consensual, nothing else counts. So if it's exploitive and there's power differential and there's use of power to gain access to somebody for sex in all sorts of you know harmful and really terrible ways, it, it, are we saying that the only way to get ahead in the workplace is to you know re- relinquish your body sexually to somebody's? So you can have a career advantage. Uh, you know, is, is, is this what we're saying about the world? As long as it's consensual and it's, you know, it's two adults. Um, so the, the whole idea of exploitation is a, is an, is an, a vital conversation that has, doesn't have to happen near enough. is starting to come out into our day-to-day, uh, you know, discourse. You yeah. know, do I get to use power, my power over you to gain access to you for sex? Is this a, a reasonable adult interaction, as long as it's consensual. 
and I don't force myself on you or rape you. I guess, are we saying this is reasonable conduct? So what does, what does exploitation look like typically in a, ro- in a romantic relationship? We, I get the idea of like in a Hollywood relationship with Harvey Weinstein using his power as a producer and to, yeah. to, like, to say, hey, you know, you'll never work in this business again if we don't do this. So if you say yes, that's consent and that's exp- exploitative. But yeah. in, in, a, in a partnership, uh, what does that look like? Well, let, let's start with some of the most common and aspects of interpersonal relationships we don't like talking about, and that's violence in interpersonal relationships, where one person it, it might be re- resorting to violence or threats of violence mm. um, uh, in, in, in the relationship. I mean, domestic violence, interpersonal violence is a, is a fairly big issue in our country, Um and uh, oftentimes, uh, sexual activity is part of the coercion uh, to use fear. Uh, you know, sometimes people will have sex with a partner uh, in hopes that they won't resort to physical violence. So that's a form of exploitation. I mean, these are the more egregious forms. Um, but it can even be in the kinds of uh, exploitation where uh, a husband might be out with their partner in some sort of public setting and engage in a kind of physical contact with their partner um, that, uh, that they know the partner doesn't like. Uh, but they'll, they'll grab a part of their body that they know the partner is embarrassed if they grab. But they'll do it in public because they know the partner won't make a scene in the public mm. uh, like they would someplace else. So I can kind of get away with this here. Um, you know, that that's these are, you know, common exploitive things. I was watching a a program on Netflix, just uh, it's, it's called The Last Tango in Halifax. And this, this, but this older couple that's found each other after many years and are getting married. And, and the, 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 the husband, the, the, the man is older and his, his brother comes from another country to greet his uh, brother's newfound love that they're going to marry. And he walks up and greets her and they show on the s- screen that his hand kind of g- goes down towards her rear end and squeezes a little bit the first time he's ever met her. And this is in front of the whole family. Wow. Now, this is in a Hollywood scene, but that's a form of exploitation. There's a sense that no objection would be raised. The power differential, there's too many dynamics going on. So a person takes advantage of those kind of dynamics to kind of have a kind of physical contact that in another context could be could be uh, opposed. So, you know, and then, of course, exploitation is a vital uh, behavior uh, to go on in a couple when a person has a sexual secret. Mm. They don't want that secret to become known. I mean, not being honest is part of it, but exploitation is knowing I've done this and I'm going to work very hard to convince you that I've not done this. Mm. Um, You know, uh, information's power. And exploitation is about the use of power to gain access to somebody for sexual activity. So anything that puts you in a position of power that allows you to pleasure because or, lots of people love power exchanges for pleasure. So, right. Yeah, right. No, yeah. Right. Um, uh, w- would a, a sense of exploitation be, or would ex- how do I put this? Would an example of exploitation be um, maybe even using sex as a bargaining chip or withholding affection or withholding, uh, I don't know, trying to restrict certain liberties in your relationship. Like somebody saying, I'm cutting off your, I'm taking, taking you off the credit card or we're not going to have sex for a month. If you do that, are are those exploitative behaviors as well? Exploitive behaviors. Uh, Well, I'd have to know more of the context for the motivation for that. Um, But, you know, again, there, there's a, there's a resorting to power. Got it. There's a resorting to power. And anytime we're resorting to power as a way in which to navigate a conflict or a dilemma in a relationship, we have to ask ourselves why we're using that tactic. Um, so what are, some, what are some good questions you think couples could start asking each other to have a conversation around non-ex- non-exploitation? What's been your experience with being exploited in life? Uh, I mean, who in the world can be 30 years old without having tons of exploitation directed at them? Uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the most common form of exploitation children deal with is being bullied. Yeah. You know, somebody has a position of power and they're going to get bullied. Uh, you know, so we don't call it exploitation with kids. We call it bullying. But they're ex- they're, the kids are being exploited. So, well, you know, n- rather than deal with a couple, just talk. Here's some stories I had about being exploited. Tell me mm-hmm. yours. That's a great place to start. 
Okay, let's go to principle number three. Uh, principle number three um, is protection from HIV, sexually transmitted infections, um, uh, and unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. Uh, this, this, so, you know, this is what we think always think sexual health is. Um, you know, is 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 you know those typical health consequences, and so you know we don't need to say a whole lot about this, but it is really important. Uh, one of the things I feel is really important, and it depends on where people are with contraception, but typically everybody has some form of contraception, whether it's even just not having sex unless they want to conceive, or whether they use some sort of uh, you know religiously sanctioned form of how to plan a pregnancy, um, or whether they use medically assisted or hormonal assisted or barriers or latex barriers such as a condom there's all sorts of ways in which to you know you know protect from and and have a, a planned pregnancy rather than an unplanned pregnancy so th- the issue i like to ask people is what's your contraception plan everybody should have a contraception plan if they're involved in sexual intercourse and activity with somebody at any time they should have a contraception plan unless they're expecting any form of intercourse uh, vaginal penile intercourse if they expect that to okay if a pregnancy happens a pregnancy happens okay well that's your contraception plan it's we'll just get pregnant we don't know when we will but we might uh, that's a contraception plan because uh, certainly not every act of sexual intercourse leads to, um, you know, a pregnancy. Yeah. So the so, idea is here, both partners need to be on the same page with regards well, to these things. Well, well, that's shared values. Uh, that, that's another, this is how they interact. Uh, you know, you know, some, the, lots of people aren't on the same page when it comes to contraception plans. Uh, and usually they're called parents, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> So, you know, you, you've got to have agreement uh, on these things. And that's that's shared values. That's a different one. Okay. Because each person may have a different contraception plan. Got it. Got and it. one might be more effective than the other. For sure. Um, and then, of course, there's HIV and sexually transmitted infections. This comes up very quite early. If, if you'll see on television now they're showing 10, 11-year-old kids in health commercials about cancer prevention. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, a, 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 a vaccination that can be given to kids to prevent cervical cancer. Uh, by having this uh, vaccination before they become sexually active. It can still be effective at later times in adolescence, but it's really best to give before they have any opportunity to be sexually active. And it is an enormously effective way to prevent cancer Mm. later in life. But, you know, that's another, you know, you have to have values about that. You know, uh, there are people that have very different values about whether to give that vaccination. So these things start very early. Is Um, Is that the next principle is values? Uh, the neg- shared values is, yes, shared values. So you can see how if you're going to have a contraception plan, if you're going to deal with sexually transmitted infections, or if you're going to deal with HIV prevention, it all involves values. And this is, the, this is the most subjective sexual health principle of them all. Because values are personal. Values are um, uh, come from many sources. Um, uh, values are a source of enormous conflict and agreement uh, between couples. Um, and they're they're very difficult things to discuss um, uh, when there's uh, differences in values. Mm. Why um, do you think they're so difficult to discuss when there's a difference? Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, we don't have much experience talking about values differences. Um, our nation right now is an example of literally a, a nation that is having difficulty talking about differences in values. Yeah. Um, so, the, the, you know, historically, value differences um, oftentimes turn into uh, polarities, right or wrong, correct or incorrect, moral or immoral. Um, and when values get discussed in a kind of binary way, either or, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't create an opportunity f- to be curious and interested in how somebody came to the values they have. Mm. Why is it this value is so important to you? Uh, the most uh, uh, important value that is, uh, I find, in, in the development and sexual life of people, particularly in our country and many, many, many countries around the world, is the value of when one person has their sexual debut. 
Uh, we tend to call it virginity or losing virginity. I don't like that phrase. Um, you know, when somebody goes from crawling to walking, we don't spend the rest of our life saying, oh, my God, they lost their crawling. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of tend to yeah. celebrate milestones of moving towards adulthood and all of the kinds of responsibilities and skills we expect an adult to have. One of those responsibilities and responsibilities and joys of adulthood is uh, having an active and a highly enjoyable sexual life. But when one begins to have this sexual life uh, is one of the most contentious and lack of agreed upon values on the planet. Mm. When does somebody have their sexual debut is there is no agreement on this. On no, the there's a lot of people giving their opinion. There's government, there's religion, there's individual families, mm -hmm. there's yeah. schools. Like, yeah, everybody's got their opinion about when they should have their first intercourse and typically from a you know from a values perspective the first intercourse is almost always thought of as intercourse between a man with a penis and a woman with a vagina that that's it uh, any any other combination isn't really thought of as the sexual debut um so the the, the that value is so controversial and there's no agreement upon it on the planet and yet kids will spend their whole growing up preoccupied with when it's going to happen uh and uh and adults will be very preoccupied as when their kids are going to have it yeah um, and there's and everybody's got the idea of when it's supposed to happen the right way and and feeling ashamed that it happened too early or with the wrong person or embarrassed that it hasn't happened yet yep or yep. Yes. It, it, yeah. So there is there is so much emphasis placed on that one moment on the life of a human being and the values and the intensity of meaning and moral, uh, you know, consequence of that particular moment in life. Uh, you know, there are still planets in the in the in the planet that, uh, uh, you know, if somebody does this wrong, they, the family can just kill them. Right. Uh, you, you know, talk about a value. So, you know, this idea of, you know, when the sexual debut uh, and couples could certainly talk about how was that for you? What was it like for you growing up worried about when you were going to have your sexual debut? What was it like for you when you did it? Um, what, what's been the consequence of how you thought about yourself because of how you chose to do that? Uh, th th this story lives in every marriage. Yes. Every marriage. And going beyond that, like, let's talk about the values that you were raised with around sex. Did your family talk about it? Did they not? Like, when they did talk about it, what was it like? Was it positive or negative? Did you ever feel embarrassed or upset because you maybe weren't doing things the way you wanted your parents to or left out because your friends did things differently than you did or believed things differently than you did? Well, Nate, look at how many conversations you can have. You just spewed them out in 15 seconds. Well, I mean, just because I listen to you all the time. There's three years of a marriage right there. You could yeah. start talking about those things. Yeah. So, and then how do we, if we want to have kids, how do we want to raise our kids? And how do we create a family environment where the values that we want live in a, within our marriage and our, and the doors of our home? So you can see how this this just lives uh, constantly in the life of a couple. Uh, values are constantly there. I think the important thing is is not to see differences in values yeah. um, as a crisis, because we, you are going to have values differences. Um, it's it, uh, you know how do you resolve a values difference um, with the priority being in mind of the relationship. So What's more important, the values or the relationship? Can we can we dive a little bit into that? Um, and maybe you can give us some examples or advice on when there is a values difference and you're kind of confronting this in the moment, what are some do's and don'ts that will help us um, manage that, that emotional conversation? It's kind of a visceral experience, I think, to realize that, the, that somebody that you really love might have a difference in values. Uh, it can feel like a betrayal. It can feel, I think it be, can be very painful. Right. I think the first thing is somehow somebody thinks it's personal. Yes. I, I guess this is personal. Like this is either about me. I know I've, 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 I've talked with people who have very painful, difficult values differences. And for some people, they may see the values difference as questioning themselves. How could I choose somebody to love who has this value? What does this say about me? 
Mm-hmm. And they may they may have their own doubts or questions uh, and and fears about what does this say about me if I if I love somebody who has this value. Um, uh, so so sometimes it can feel personal, but it isn't personal. It's really just you're you're sitting and questioning yourself because you're in love with somebody who has this kind of personal belief system or value that that can happen. Um, but I think the important thing is is to find out how often in a couple do you use the word values. Mm. Just, is that even part of your language? What are your values? You know, and be curious rather than judgmental. Yeah, I, I, I have a values activity that I take people through and I do workshops, and I'm surprised at how few people know what their core values are. They know they they can identify things that they value, things that are important to them, but they I think a lot of people have never gone through the process of trying to understand what are the values that are at the core of who I am that make up my character that make that they kind of comprise the lens through which I experience life. And, and it's really hard to um, navigate these conversations when you don't have an understanding of your own core values and the core values of your partner so that you can have some empathy and understanding for how they view the world differently than you. Yes. It's a, yeah, it's it's powerful experience when you can actually start to nail those down. One of the ways values discussions get avoided um, is when couples have the same religion. Uh, there can be an assumption because they have the same faith and the same religion um, that th- their values don't necessarily need even to be discussed. Mm. Um, because it will, uh, you know, I, I remember a, a couples therapist was working with a, a, a relatively young couple. I think they were still in their teens. Um, and they were asking them about this, these, these six principles of sexual health. And they said, oh, we've got that shared values one down pat. And they said, oh, really? Well, how come? He said, well, we just go to the same church. Uh, and the assumption was that because they go to the same church, they, of course, have all the same values. They didn't even need to discuss them. Right. Uh, And so, you know, no relationship is immune from having important discussions about values. I love it. I'm glad that we hammered that one home. I think that's a that is a year's worth of conversations right there. Just figuring that stuff out. And these are hard conversations. I think one of the things oftentimes for couples is they've never actually perhaps they might don't have examples of what values conversations look like maybe growing up amongst their own parents or their family of origin or among their friendship circle, you know, where, where do people learn how to have these conversations? Oftentimes it's, um, there's not a lot of good places where people feel like they've learned how to do this. And it's like, wow, that, that, you know, that, that's a good lesson. I'll talk about values that way. Yes. They're hard to come by. It is hard to come by and they're hard to navigate, but this is what, this is what like builds trust and connection inside of your relationship is having the hard conversations and then realize in the aftermath, Hey, we're still here. We went through that really hard thing together and you get, you become uh, trench mates. One of the things I've talked a lot with the clients I've worked over the years is I call it um, the severing response. And the severing response is a threat that can live in a relationship where there's a certain action there's a certain uh, behavior, there's a certain value or attitude you'll have um, that I'm willing to institute the severing response as a way to respond to it. And the severing response is, that's it, relationship over, done. Mm. You, you know, I, I'm, I'm, that's it, it's done, over. Right. And the, 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 the threat of the severing response in a relationship can make values discussions almost impossible. Mm. Uh, if because there's this sense of um, y- you will uh, you know leave me end being with me yeah uh, and, and you know without, I'm sorry if I say or do the wrong thing that's right that's right and and what there's, I like there's to mysterious do, landmines around the conversation that if I accidentally step on one then I lose everything right. So one of the things I I think can be helpful for couples to talk about is go through their family history, uh, parents' generation, aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, go back a couple of generations, and and look at how many relationships the solution in those couples was to sever and end the relationship. Um, I'll give you an example. A a man told me once he was with his father in a grocery store in a, 
urban large city, standing in line, waiting in line, and this older man walks by, um, and the father leans over to his son and says, do you see that old guy that just walked by? He said, yeah. I said, that's your grandfather. They didn't speak. Wow. He learned as a quite a young boy that one of the solutions their family had to conflict was you just sever the relationship. And that lived in fear for him his entire childhood because he watched a parent sever with another family member, just absolute, that was it. They did not speak, even in each other's presence. That has a resonance in children. They are watching. Yeah. It, it, and they're also watching, is that an acceptable way for our family to behave? We just sever. We just cut people off. And this has consequences in marital relationships if that's your family history. Yeah. I remember, um, if I could tell a quick story that's, that's similar, um, I, I have a, 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 uh, somebody who's close to me who went through a divorce and he told me that um, one of the moments that he realized that's still just like really profound for him that his marriage probably didn't have legs was when his wife came home one day and said, so-and-so just caught her husband looking at pornography. If I ever caught you doing that, we would get a divorce. Mm-hmm. And he, he immediately thought, well, I guess I can never talk to you about the fact that I have looked at pornography or if I ever do in the future, I can never disclose that to you because then I risk losing everything. Wow. So immediately there were things off, off limits. And he said, in addition, after that conversation ha- he happened, he started to wonder what other things he might do that would cause the relationship to implode that he didn't know about yet. Right. Right. So the, so the severing response, the threat of the severing response absolutely can stifle difficult conversations. It'll 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 obstruct sexual health conversations from happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Should we bump on to principle number 5? The, the next the next principle is honesty. Uh, shared values and honesty are the most subjective of the sexual health principles. So, and of course, honesty, you know, we could spend the rest of our time talking about honesty. But I, I think the important thing about honesty is to ask yourself, um, what, is, what, what are my expectations of honesty uh, with a partner I'm in a relationship with? What are my expectations of honesty? Mm. Um, we too often focus on the expectations of honesty of our partner, but I think it starts with us. Uh, and, you know, and, and am I meeting my expectations of honesty that I want to have with the person I'm in a relationship with? Yeah. And when you don't, what happens? When you, 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 when you don't meet your own expectations for honesty, right? What's typically, typically the response. Well, the first thing is, is do you have any way of saying, you know, I, I wasn't as honest with you as I'd like to be? Is that, is that something that can be said in a couple without it becoming a volcanic eruption? Uh, if, if the response to somebody saying, you know, I haven't been as, as honest with you as I wanted to be is terror or fury, uh, that's the immediate response. It's very difficult to continue to admit to less than your ideal standard of honesty the next time. It, we have to normalize the fact that somebody hasn't been able to be completely honest. That's called human behavior. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, it, it just is. It's human. I think it's easy to, to think like, well, it just depends on what the thing they're hiding is. You know, if they're hiding, oh, I ate the last cookie, that's different than saying I'm hiding the, the second family that I have across the country. Um, but, but it's interesting how, I, I, I think I'm trying to get to this, the idea that um, the principle, even though the severity of the situations is different, the principle holds true that, that it kills the opportunity to have a conversation or a negotiation or... Uh, ex- explore what the next step is mm-hmm. if there's that volcanic eruption. The other thing about honesty is I believe honesty when it comes to sexual health and sexuality helps us understand who we are and where we come from. Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example. In my family, I found out talking to my 80-some-year-old grandmother that her husband, my grandfather, fathered a child out of wedlock in the Depression. And had to pay child support 
lost a paternity suit. Uh, my father had a half sister. Never spoken about until I'm talking to my 80 some year old grandmother. Wow. So I go home to my father and I knew her name was Anne. And he says, so what was your lunch like with, you know, your grandmother? And I, I said, well, we talked about Anne. And his face got ashen and, and absolutely, you know, shocked. And then he f- had disgust on his face. Absolute disgust. What were you talking about her for? And what I became to understand was that secret lived in my family my entire life. And I, I remembered stories. I remembered events happening. We had a family tree that was published in, in the 70s. And it was the, the whole multi-generational family that immigrated from Germany from the you know early, uh, late 1800s. And I remember that, that, that my grandmother being furious that this family tree was being published. And I couldn't understand, why is, why is she mad about this family tree being published? Well, I come to find out all these years later, she was afraid, was Anne going to be in the family tree? Uh, yeah. Well, that could never get spoken about. We could never be told why she was so upset. So honesty helps us understand what's happening around us. Yeah. It's not just about hiding truth. It's about helping us know who we are. And be and being fully seen. I remember in one of the episodes that we recorded on the the rethinking porn addiction um, show, Kristen said something to the extent of, "Do I want to know my partner for who he really is, or who I need him to be in order for me to feel comfortable?" Yes. And this honesty principle is. Uh, the idea behind it is like, if you can share with your partner who you are, what your desires are, what your fantasies are, what bothers you, what what you enjoy, um, even though it's really hard and maybe be really uncomfortable to talk about those things, you're allowing yourself to be fully seen and accepted yes. and allowing to and uh, accepting your partner in, in the same way. And I think a lot of people, because they can't tolerate that anxiety, would rather assume that their partner is somebody that they're not because it makes them comfortable at the expense of truly knowing who they're with. Right. So, so you just moved to the la- us to the last principle, which is pleasure. All of those things to be honest about were about who, what pleasures you, what, what excites you, what erotically pleases you, what do you fantasize about? What are, what are some of your favorite sexual things to do that just give you such pleasure? You can hardly stand it. It's so fabulous. Uh, you know, uh, and these are hard things sometimes for a partner to know about the other partner. Um, the, the difficulty with what's erotic is it, it is not, um, it doesn't follow rules. Uh, you know, the, the world of the erotic is, is not politically correct. Um, the world of the erotic doesn't necessarily cooperate with religious values. Um, the world of the erotic doesn't necessarily cooperate with a relationship agreement. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, the world of the erotic, it might be a huge contradiction to who you understand your partner to be. Well, that's not who I love. You like that. Um, and these are very difficult conversations. Um, I'll, I'll just give you an example of what it can look like. Yeah, that'd be great. There's a, 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 a person who ends up watching sexual imagery uh, and uh, they have this sort of agreement in the couple that they're not going to look at sexual imagery. But the reason this guy looks at sexual imagery is actually what turns him on most is listening to people make sex sounds and talk about sex. You know, you know, do this, do that. You know, I don't want to go into details here, but, you know, they really, like, they really like that. But it's the sound of the voice. It's the inflection of the voice. It's, it's, it's a sound erotic map. In other words, what erotically most turns them on is sound related to sex. And this person happened to have a partner who didn't like to talk during sex at all. And so when he wanted to have his most erotically pleasurable experience, he, he there, there wasn't room to negotiate this because he didn't know this. He had to come to therapy with out-of-control sexual behavior, all of these looking at sexual imagery, uh, it got called a porn addict. Um, and the reality was he did not know that his primary erotic charge was sound. He didn't know this. I mean, it's, it, if you think about it, we don't necessarily know these things. We just enjoy them. Right. Uh, you know, it's like if, like if your favorite dessert, what do you like most about it? And this isn't until you're asked that you're like, oh, I guess I like it tastes good. 
Okay, yeah. yeah, it just takes it's like it's it's just this simple explanation, but no, you when you think about it, it's like, oh, I like the texture, I like the smell, I like the color. I mean the memories you, associated with it. Memory, yeah, right. So you have to slow down, you have to really kind of think about it. It's not something we just know how to say. Well, the same thing with the world of the erotic. We don't necessarily know how to we don't necessarily know how to say these things. We just sort of they're just they're just turn us on and we don't even think about it. So oftentimes this this man then had to had to figure out I like sex sounds and he was you know he was wasn't that old of a guy so he's got like many decades ahead of enjoying sex sounds he's got to figure out how to do this you're not going to make it go away uh and so he never and so then he had to kind of eventually figure out how to talk with this about his partner um and and they work some things out but you know until you know who you are erotically it's very difficult to be honest about who you are erotically. I love that. Doug, I could listen to you talk about this stuff all day. Um, I think if couples literally watched five minutes of this interview at a time and just picked out this, the principles of sexual health and made it a goal over the next five, six, seven weeks. Well, how about the next 35 years of that? Yeah. Well, it'll be fine. Yeah, but even no just luck. a starting point. Like, <laughs> let's spend one week talking about one principle and see where we get. Wow. It, it can change your life. And and like I said, when even just a simple principle at the very beginning of just discussing the balance of safety and pleasure inside your relationship. Yeah. It, there are so many people who rely on. Um, we talked about this last last week on the episodes. A, a sexual relationship of leftovers, mm-hmm. where there's the things I'm comfortable talking about and the things you're comfortable talking about, and then where those two things overlap, that's what we do, and everything else is off limits because it, it makes us uncomfortable. So what whatever's left over is what we have as our sexual dynamic, and I feel like following this template and having these conversations about the principles of sexual health will open up the opportunity for couples and individuals to experience pleasure they've never experienced before Mm -hmm. connection and honesty and shared values that they've never known existed there. And they get to to experience a true form of connection that isn't possible without having these conversations that you just beautifully modeled. So I would really encourage people to go slow. Yes. And not expect yourself to go faster than is reasonable. Some couples might be able to do this far more, you know, confidently than other couples. Respect where you are rather than, uh, you know, place yourself in a situation with your partner that one, maybe one partner is far less prepared for this than the other. Yeah. Uh, You've got to respect that rather than judge them for that uh, or, you know, somehow diminish them for their, their, their fear or their worry or their anxiety. There's a good reason that that's there. Um, And it may have something to do with these sexual health principles having been violated in their life many times. And they don't even know how to say that. Beautifully said. Thank you. That is a great way to leave this interview. Doug, I know you're working on a book right now. Yes. Um, and it's for the the layperson. I know that the book <laughs> right. the the you know made is not for the this general is, public. This is for therapists. That is a four hundred page book for therapists to learn how to work with men without a control sexual behavior. Michael Vigorito and I are in the process right now of writing a book for the general public that uses the same kind of ideas. Uh, but our book that we're writing is not. You don't have to be. Uh, you know, in therapy for out of control sexual behavior for the, the book we're writing to be of value. We're really just interested in people learning about sexual health and hopefully learning about how to understand who they're who they are and what their vision of sexual health is without having to injure people before they get in the conversation. Well, if you, if you want to hear more of Doug, you can go to the rethinkingpornaddiction.com website and we do weekly phone calls where we have conversations like this. Yeah. And I hope I would like to give you a blank check to come back anytime you want, especially <laughs> to promote the, the new book. Well, uh, you know, I would love to have that new book finished so I could come back here and promote it. Good. But I'm in the middle of writing it right now. So we'll, we'll have a, we'll pencil in something on the calendar and then in the, in the in the distant future when that's ready to go. But thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for spending the last four decades of your life learning about this stuff so that you could come here and teach it so beautifully. This is, I'm going to be honest with you right now. And I don't say this, I'm doing it live so it can be documented. This is, I think one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done. And I've done many, many interviews and uh, you're a real blessing to, to me and to many other people. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Nate. Look, I am a firm believer that most couples don't need therapy to have a great marriage. 
but it's incredibly rare that you'll ever get the type of marriage that you're capable of without a little bit of guidance and encouragement. There's just too much working against you, whether it's the fact that you didn't grow up with good examples of marriage or the terrible stuff that we get exposed to from Hollywood and reality TV, or just the fact that you're two imperfect humans trying to create an amazing life together, even though nobody has ever taught you how to do that. Now, I'm a firm believer that working on your marriage shouldn't have to feel like work. And that's exactly why I created the Epic Marriage Club. Here's how it works. You get regular monthly workshops and trainings from the top marriage experts in the world. Then every single week, I transform those lessons into an actionable experiment that we'll do together because you only get results when you take action. And you'll be doing these experiments with an amazing community of awesome couples that care as much about having a great marriage as you do. Plus, I'll do a monthly Q&A session to make sure that you never get stuck or hung up on anything. It's literally everything you need to have a truly epic marriage. And the best part, it's freaking fun. You get all that and a whole bunch of other awesome stuff that I haven't mentioned yet for the price of a movie ticket. So go sign up right now at epicmarriageclub.com.